everybody. Did you, you like the movie? Yeah. I really liked it. This was actually the second time I got to see it because they let me watch it at home to get ready for today. So my name is Stephanie or Beetle Lady, or Dr. Dole, and I am what you call an entomologist. And yes, that is a bug on my face. That's a whip scorpion. They have a scary name, but they're totally harmless. Do you guys know what an entomologist is? Help me with this sentence. An entomologist is a scientist who studies and teaches about? Bugs. Exactly. I love bugs. Anybody else here love bugs? And it's okay to not all raise your hands. We don't all have to like the same things. Life would be boring if we did. So the first thing I wanna do, um, well, let me tell you what I do. So I have this business called Beetle Lady and I go to schools and libraries. I have a pop-up museum and I teach people to love bugs too, or at least to not be as afraid of them. So what I wanted to do before we get started is I kind of feel the need to stretch. I was sitting over here too. Um, and so I thought we could all stand up and stretch together. So everybody stand up. Stay in your places though. And one of the ways that I like to move myself when I stretch is I like to make funny bug antennae. Do you know what antennae are? They're the little things that come off of insects' heads. So let me give you three or four options for different bug antennae you can make while we do a little stretch. So the first one I'm gonna show you, one of my favorite things in entomology is all the fun, silly words I get to learn. So one kind of antennae that I'm, antenna that I'm gonna show you is what a moth has. They have ones that look like feathers. So you can fan out, I'm just gonna do one since I have to hold this microphone. These are called plumos antennae, just like a plume. And they're really good for smelling things because moths are really good at smelling things like pheromones. Another antenna that I really like are called lamellate and they're on like scarab beetles. So there's one end, put your thumb like that. And then the cool thing about lamellate is they can open and close. So you can go ch like that. And these will find on scarab beetles. Another one I like to do are ants. Ants have what we call elbow antennae. So they actually have like a little bend in them. So you can just kind of make an L and stick it on your head and feel around with those. Insects use their antennae to smell and feel and taste the world. They can sense how hot it is, how cold it is, and if it's wet or dry, and they can sense all different kinds of chemicals. And the last one is kind of very simple. It's what our little fly has. It's just a little, we call these an arista, just a little like hair coming out. You don't really notice fly antennae too much most of the time because they have really small ones. So our little fly friend had ones like that. All right, does everybody feel like they got a good stretch in? All right, let's sit back down and let's meet some of the bugs. Oh, so the photos, I wanna tell you that what I have done is I have put together photos. One of my favorite things I get to do as an entomologist is go to cool places. This is the Amazon rainforest and I get to look at bugs and I get to sometimes when I was a student, I would collect bugs. Now what I love to do is take pictures of bugs because I can share them with you. So the photos you're gonna see are all pictures I've taken of bugs from around the world. So let's meet some of the real bugs in Rosa and the Stone Troll. Let's name some of the bugs. What bugs did you guys see in the movie? Raise your hand and tell me. What bugs did you see? Name one of them. Fly. We saw a fly. What about you? A beetle. A beetle. What did you see? A worm, a worm. yeah. There were stick bugs, yeah. What did you see? There was, there was a big spider, right? Okay, let's go back a little. How about you in the pink sweatshirt? What did you see? A mosquito playing in the band, right? Yeah. What did you see? A bee. Yeah, one of our big characters was the flower bee. Nobody's named our main, main, one of our main characters. The silk moth, right, or the silk butterfly. So we saw lots of bugs. So I wanna show you what some of those bugs would look like in the real world, because movies like this take their inspiration from the real world. So let's look at some of these bugs. So the, one of the first bugs we met was flower bee. And of course, what did flower bee say he was gonna do? I should actually say she, right? Because if flower bee is gonna be making honey, flower bee is a girl bee, not a boy bee. The boy bees don't make honey. So she um, was out visiting the flowers that our, our um, flower fairy was opening up, that Rosa was opening up. And these are some real pictures of honeybees. Have you ever seen a honeybee up that close? 
They're actually super duper fuzzy wuzzy. Yeah. And those hairs, they'll use those hairs to collect um, pollen from the flowers, which is how they pollinate. We also first met, oops, somehow I got a little URL on there accidentally. First we met um, our, our main character, the silk butterfly. We met her when she was a caterpillar, right? Caterpillars get all sorts of crazy. Here's a beautiful caterpillar up in the top there with lots of weird spikes. And then, you know, in the beginning of the movie, the first, first bugs we see are some beetles and they're cradling their baby beetles. Well, what a baby beetle really looks like is that. They look like a caterpillar too. So all of these sorts of animals, in fact, even our fly at one point looked like a caterpillar. And then she did what? She she turned into a cocoon or a chrysalis, and you can even kind of see her in there. These are one of my favorite structures in entomology. Look at this. This is a real chrysalis of a butterfly that I got to photograph at a butterfly farm in Ecuador. It's the kind of place that raises butterflies and then ships them to places like the Cal Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Maybe you've been there and seen the butterflies. A lot of them were raised by people like this in this farm, or my friend Ernesto has a farm in Costa Rica where he raises them. And look at all those ones up there. Those are a whole bunch of different kinds, and they're often as beautiful as the butterflies they become. And then she emerges like this. And blue is a very popular butterfly color. These are a couple of blue butterflies that I've met. And perhaps the most famous blue butterfly is the one that I have a real specimen of here. Have you guys heard of a blue morpho? And I'm hoping the lights in here, you can kind of see how it shines and reflects. The amazing thing about a blue morpho butterfly is that this color will never, ever fade. This color is what we call structural color. So instead of pigment like you and I have in our skin, or like you'll see in some yellow butterflies, these, this is as if the butterfly is covered in glitter or sequins. It's not the color of the butterfly, it's the way the light is bouncing back at your eyes. And you know how like if you have lip sequins on something, they can be different colors, the way you shine the light on them? Well, that's the way this is too. And in fact, inside, on the other side of the butterfly, when it closes its wings, it's very brown and plain. And I've gotten to see these in the rainforest, and you wouldn't think that they're a very good camouflage like that, but what you actually see is a flash of blue here, and then a flash of blue here, and then a flash of blue here. And so it's really, really good for making it so that something that might eat it, like an owl or something, might not be able to track where it's flying, because you just see these bursts of blue. Did you have a question? Oh, how did I get the butterfly? I have a lot of entomologist friends, and so this one I got from one of my entomologist friends, yeah. Yeah, and some of them I collected myself. I've never collected a blue morpho. They are protected, so um, it probably comes from a butterfly farm. Okay. Ah, I got my URL on there accidentally again. We also saw a couple moths. Moths are related to butterflies. We saw this big fuzzy moth that was a little bit rude to Rosa, but pointed Rosa in the right direction. Did you know that moths can be really, really fuzzy like that? Yeah, look at this orange moth. Can you believe how fuzzy that is? It's almost like it's wearing a fur collar. When do moths come out? Just yell it out. In the night. When you go out at night, do you have to put on an extra layer to keep warm? Yeah, and this is part of why moths tend to be a lot more fuzzy than butterflies. Just like a nice warm coat is going to keep us warm, a nice warm collar of fur is going to keep a moth warm. I also noticed throughout the movie these beautiful little white moths. White is a great color to be if you're a moth because you don't have to be colorful like a butterfly because you're flying at night when there isn't a lot um, of light. So things that are white often show up better at night, right? Have you noticed that? Like you can see a white t-shirt better than a black t-shirt if you get up in the middle of the night. Okay, this is one of my favorite guys. It was funny, the movie that we watched a few years ago also had a fly that had this kind of trumpety mouth part, I remember. And our little friend who we just called Fly, um, that is actually a pretty relatively accurate fly mouth part. Flies have these long mouth parts, and I challenge you that the next time a fly lands on a piece of bread or a piece of fruit in front of you, you stop and watch it. Don't swat it away, and you'll see this little thing come down and kind of pat whatever it's walking on. It's like a little sponge um, that it can use to suck up juices from things like rotten fruits 
or dog poop or things like that. And that's why we don't like flies landing on our food, right? Because we don't know where they've been. Um, you can see this huge um, fly. This is a tabanid fly. And you can see its big mouth part. That mouth part's actually for biting people. So they can have a kind of a painful bite. And mosquitoes are another kind of a fly. And we saw those in the movie, too. OK. This is what you've been waiting for. So we, we met our spider, right? Um, so you know what I loved about this spider? I loved the glasses. Wasn't that the best part? And what was great about, because when I'm an entomologist, when you're a scientist who knows all the real facts about these bugs and what's right and what's wrong, you notice things that aren't right in the movies, like does that bee have the right number of wings and things like that. Well, I love that the spider had glasses, because even though spiders don't wear glasses, a lot of spiders, despite having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eyes, have horrible eyesight. So I want to show you this. This big, big spider here is a wolf spider. Um, beautiful, beautiful animal. Do you think that animal has good eyesight? Yeah. yeah, this one does. It has huge, big front eyes, just like we do. The four ones under it, and then the two on the sides on the top of the head. This is the tarantula that I'm going to bring out in just a minute. Do you, can you even hardly see the eyes on this animal? They're tiny, right? Tarantulas have horrible eyesight. So that's what they're known for. So. When I was asked to come today, I thought, OK, I'm going to be in an audience full of kids, and I'm not going to be able to walk up to every single kid like I do sometimes when I come to a classroom and let them touch the bugs and things like that. So we've got to go big. So you may have noticed, to decorate the stage, I brought this really big bug display of some of the biggest bugs in the world. And they are real bugs. They're dead, but they're real. So then I thought, well, I never do stuff without a live bug. So. The live bug I decided needed to be a bug that was in the movie, a bug that I had, and a bug mm, that might be big enough to eat a flower fairy. So what I have brought for you today is what's called a Bahia bird eater tarantula. And you guys are lucky, because if we were in a classroom, I actually wouldn't bring this spider. This spider only teaches with me usually at home or in settings like this where nobody is going to be right next to the spider. And that's not because she bites. That's because she has hairs that are itchy, which actually all tarantulas have hairs that are itchy. Her hairs, instead of making your nose and eyes itch right away if you get into contact with the, any of them, they'll make your skin burn like, like you rolled in a plant called stinging nettle. Do you know about stinging nettle? It's like that. So if I let a kid hold her, you'd be fine. This was exciting. This was fun. And then tonight you'd go, I don't like the beetle lady. So I'm going to put on gloves, and I'm going to walk her down the aisle so you can see her. Um, and that's pretty neat. So she is not quite this big. She is very big. Um, and before I show you, I want to show you why we call these bird eaters. This spider has actually never eaten a bird or a flower fairy in her life. Her favorite food right now is big cockroaches, because she's a little too big to eat crickets. The reason we call these bird eater tarantulas, let me show you this book. I also brought a big book. Have you ever seen a book this big? Look at this. This is a book by one of the most important scientists in entomology. It's a woman named Maria Siblia Marianne, and she lived a really long time ago. She made this book in 1705. That's a long time ago, right? That's hundreds of years ago. And she was an explorer and an artist and a scientist. And she painted one of the first pictures of a bird-eating tarantula. I'm going to show it to you. And her picture depicted it. I put the bookmark in it. There it is. Actually eating a hummingbird in the rainforest. So it's pretty amazing. And so everybody who saw this picture then thought, those are bird-eating tarantulas. That's what we're going to call them forever and ever and ever. They will eat birds, but not very often. They'll eat little mice. They'll eat little lizards. They eat mostly like grasshoppers and things like that. OK. so. We're going to meet Anansi now. I'm going to get down here, put on my gloves so I don't get a rash on my hand. And I'm going to pull her out. She's not going to bite me. And if you guys can be quiet, I know you're going to be really excited to see her walk up and down the aisles. But if you're quiet enough, I can keep telling you facts about her with my voice without the microphone. OK? Are we ready? 
Okay, how about we start by making her feel comfortable by saying, good morning, Anansi, you look beautiful today, okay? Everybody ready? Good morning, Anansi, you look beautiful today. You're gonna see that that's true, okay. Let's bring her. I have been raising her since she was a baby. I got her when she was tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, Anansi, as a female tarantula, if this was a boy of the same exact kind, he would only live about seven years. Anansi is a female, she will live 25 to 30 years. Let me bring her up and then I'll conclude. Come on, girl. In the spotlight, Anansi. <laughs> um. Someone asked me a good question that I wanted to answer on mic. Why is her name Anansi? Has anybody heard of Anansi? Raise your hand if you have. Anansi is the trickster spider god from African folklore. Um, I think Anansi in the stories is actually male, but... If you're gonna have a big spider god, that's a good name for a spider. So she's kind of my spider goddess. I don't know if anybody's ever made Anansi movies. They would be great movies. Um, there's some really good Anansi books, so maybe you guys can look those up to read to yourselves or maybe in your classroom. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna let you guys go. Oh, wow, perfect. <laughs> I hit the time mark on the nose. Um, I love meeting you guys. I love that you're here, but I understand you got to get back on those buses and go back to school. Um, my name is Stephanie, or Beetle Lady, or Dr. Dole, and if you want to learn more about what I do or see a video of Anansi taking her skeleton off, teachers, you can watch that on my website, BeetleLady.com, under Pop-Up Bug Museum. You can watch some videos about Anansi. So thank you so much. Please listen to your teachers and have a wonderful day.